Good morning. Ooh, you've been trained well. <laughs> um, just for my own edification, uh, by show of hands, how many of you are participating in the Lent series? You're, you're taking something off. Wow, one hand. Three, <laughs> five. Okay. This is, okay. <laughs> Fill this time. Uh, as none of you are aware, it is, <clears throat> this is the season of Lent. Okay, now I have to explain what Lent is. So, Lent in the Catholic and sort of Anglican traditions is this 40 days in between Ash Wednesday and Resurrection Sunday, where people, not you, are... (laughs) It'll all come clear in the end where people are reflective, they're repentant, they're they're focusing on what Christ accomplished, uh, where people are uh, contemplative and they are meditative and they possibly give something up. Uh, They they fast, Uh, they give up chocolate or social media. Now, I think those things can be helpful Uh, But we do need to be careful. None of you need to be careful. (laughs) To the five of you who raised your hand. But in a sense, we we do need to be careful of pride, which, you know, it's we're making it about us. We're making it about what we are doing uh, so that people will think, my goodness, what a pious person. And and, and what a righteous man or woman this this person is. if it helps you focus on the Lord, praise be to God. Utilize it. That, that I think can be extremely helpful. Now, as the vast majority of you didn't know it was Lent, it, you're too late because Lent started in February and there is no partial credit for <laughs> 20, 30 days of Lent. not going the way I thought it would. (laughs) But in that vein, I gave some thought to this theme that comes up in Scripture. Uh, Now, again, if you don't know, Lent, the basis of Lent is based on Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness where he fasts and he's tempted by uh, the devil. But the concept actually stretches further back Uh, historically, because there seems to be some real significance to the number 40 in Scripture, the number 40. Now, I want to be careful that this is not a a numerology series where we're just trying to find the number wherever we can in Scripture uh, for whatever purposes. No, what I want is that we are looking at the number 40, and we're only using it as a tool to consider the themes that come through Scripture. So it is, it is a thematic series that we're looking at. What we notice is that the number 40 is used, as our series indicates, for, to indicate a, a new beginning, a, a transition. Think through Scripture where this number comes to mind, 40 days of rain for Noah's Ark. Right? And the obvious new beginnings of starting the human race over with Noah and his sons. 40 in the life of Moses, which is what we're looking at today, occurs numerous times. Uh, Elijah journeys for 40 days to Mount Horeb as he's fleeing from Jezebel. And after that, he transitions his role as a prophet to Elisha. So there's a transition. And of course, Jesus has the 40 days in the wilderness, which we will look at next week. And finally, Jesus spends 40 days with his disciples in between the resurrection and his ascension, which we will look at in our third week. 
Now, you might be sitting here thinking, this just sounds like historical Bible trivia. What does this have to do with me? What is the point? The point is for us to see and to better understand and to know the character of our God. The point is for us to ask ourselves, where does my trust lie? Where is my confidence? Where is my hope? Where am I placing those things on a daily basis? The point is for us to see and know that God is the God of new beginnings. And so if you are sitting in here this morning and you are thinking, what am I doing here? Or perhaps you're sitting here as a person who's saying, I'm thankful and I'm grateful for what the Lord has done in my life. Perhaps you're a person who's sitting in here and your life is riddled with sin and guilt and shame. Or perhaps you're a person who's sitting in here and you're feeling uh, uh, emotions of abandonment or, or, or fear or anxiety. You could be sitting in here and you could be a person who is actually at odds with God and you, you, have, an, you have anger towards him. You may be sitting here and thinking, I've got it all together and I'm just waiting for everybody else to figure it out. <laughs> Beloved, I'm here to tell you that God is the God of new beginnings. And if you will focus with me, by God's grace, you will walk away an encouraged person, hungry, not just for lunch, but you will be hungry for the Lord, the God of new beginnings. So let's commit this time to prayer, if you'll join with me. Father, we need your presence. We need your Holy Spirit to help us pay attention, to help us focus. We know that their distractions abound. We may be feeling uh, certain emotions and feelings toward another person. We may be feeling uh, uh, certain emotions and feelings towards you. Lord, we're asking that by the power of your spirit, you would invade these spaces in our mind and, and, and bring clarity and focus as we turn to your word and we, and we look for our resource, which is you. So Lord, give us more of yourself. Help us to see ourselves as less. For we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Now, as we've said, we're, the series is looking at new beginnings and we're using the number 40 just merely as a thread. And this morning we're looking at Moses and the law. And the number 40 is, is really prominent in the life of Moses. I don't know if you're aware of this. If you remember, after Moses kills the Egyptian, he, he flees to Midian and he hides there for 40 years. And we read about that in Acts chapter 7, verse 30. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him, Moses, in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. It's a new beginning. For God is about to use Moses for his purposes. The, the, the Lord sends him back to free the Israelite people. And the Lord brings the, the ten plagues on Egypt until finally they are set free from slavery. Then God leads his people to Mount Sinai where Moses goes up to receive the ten commandments and the law. And he stays on the mountain for 40 days. Exodus chapter 24, verse 18, Moses entered the cloud and went up to the, onto the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And while Mount Moses is on the mountain with God, the people begin to wonder, what has happened to Moses? Where is he? Has he left us here? Has he abandoned us? And they begin to doubt and they begin to fear. And so they turn to Aaron and they, the, the, the priest and they say, set up gods for us. Who, who shall go before us? 
For all the other nations have gods. We need gods who will go before us. And so Aaron gathers all of their gold jewelry and they melt it down and they create a golden calf to worship. And Aaron said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And while Moses is with the Lord, the Lord's anger burns against the people and against Aaron. And Moses makes intercession, asking that the Lord would spare his people. Then Moses comes down the mountain to see the golden calf, and he burns with anger to the point where he smashes the tablets on the ground. And we read about this in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 6, starting in verse 16. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made yourselves a golden calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you. So I took hold of the two tablets and threw them out of my hands, my two hands, and broke them before your eyes. Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before, 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all the sin that you had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So God relents, and he gives Moses the law again. What are we seeing here? What are we seeing in this summary view of, of, of the history of Israel in this snapshot? We are seeing the holy nature and character of God. We are seeing Yahweh, who is so awesome and mighty and powerful and holy that the, peop the people are terrified of him, that their sin is an offense to him. We see that as God is moving from dealing with a family, dealing with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, that little family over the last 400 years has, has been fruitful and multiplied, and now they are a people, they are a nation. And in preparation to be a nation, the nation needs laws. They, they need to understand who God is. They need to understand what it takes to please God. Now, if you're anything like me, you would have read through some of these verses and thought, I don't know if I like this God. Just being honest. I don't know how I feel about this God who seems to be angry all the time. Beloved, we must remember that if we have a God who is not holy, who is not pure, who, who is not just, th then we're putting our trust in that God. It's pointless. Only a holy and just and pure God is worthy of worship. But beyond that, we can lose sight of the fact of what God is doing with his people here. He's just freed them from slavery in Egypt. He, he's taking them out of slavery and he's placing them in a land that he has promised to their forefathers. The land he told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that their seed would inherit. What could be more loving, what could be more gracious than to take an undeserving people group Rescue them, give them a home, give them hope, give them a future, give them a new beginning. Rather, it is the response of the people that is so offensive. The story is told of a, a young man who's living on the streets because of tragic circumstances in his life. And a church group had uh, come to volunteer uh, with a soup kitchen. And one of the members of the church struck up a conversation with this young man. And the conversation over time evolved into a relationship. And finally, the family invited the young man to stay with them. And they bought him clothing and they fed him every meal and they enrolled him in the local school. 
and the parents made it clear that, that there are rules in the house that we abide by. That the young men needed to abide by the same rules as the other children. But the young man rebelled time and time again, claiming that the family was oppressive and saying that he wanted to leave because he hated his new life. The goodness and the grace shown were viewed as hateful and oppressive. Is this not the story of Israel? A chance at a, at a new beginning and an opportunity for, for peace and for joy and for harmony and for flourishing, and, but rejected ultimately because of selfishness and because of pride. And so let me ask you, church, what new beginning is the Lord inviting you into? It could be as grand as a call to believe in him for the first time. It could be a call to a total lifestyle change. It could be a call into ministry. Or it could be as simple as growing in faith and obedience and trust and confidence in him. And alongside that, what is it that may be hindering you from entering into this new beginning. For Israel, it is their comfort, right? They, they found comfort in their position as slaves in Egypt. Did they want freedom? Of course they wanted freedom. They, they, they prayed day and night asking that the Lord would grant them freedom. But when they realized that to be free meant to put their trust in God, oh, we miss Egypt Oh, we miss the comfort. We miss the food and the predictability of Egypt, of slavery. Beloved, what is it that is keeping you from your new beginning? What is it that is keeping you from deepening your walk with the Lord? Could it be the comfort of your slavery to sin? Could it be the predictability of continuing on the way that you always have? What will it take to uproot you from this position? Because, beloved, this is what the Lord desires. And you can trust that the Lord has your best in mind as he is working out his will. He's calling you to trust in him. He's calling you to put your confidence and your hope in him and not in other things. To break down the idols that have captured your heart. To destroy the sin patterns that have taken root so that you can experience joy in this life. Rather than the shame cycle that we all experience with sin. That is why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, these things took place to this people group as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. Well, what ended up happening to Israel after this event? The Lord takes them to the, the, the very threshold of the promised land and and they send in spies to investigate the land. And we read in Numbers chapter 13, verse 25, at the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. Will they put their trust in the Lord and step into their new beginnings? Will they report to Moses that the people in this land are like giants and we are like ants to them? That conquering this people group is an impossibility. An opportunity to trust in the Lord. And they failed. So Numbers chapter 14, verse 34. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity 40 years and you shall know my displeasure. They, they failed 
to trust the Lord, the same God who had freed them against impossible odds in Egypt, the same God who had been faithful to the promises of their forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, the same God who led the people faithfully despite their faithlessness, and they doubt him. And so they enter another new beginning, this time 40 years in the wilderness. So what are we to make of all this? Certainly the writer to the Hebrews picks this up when he quotes from Psalm 95, saying, today, 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 if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years, therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, they will always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. He continues on, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Idolatry, unbelief. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Though, of course, every Sunday is uh, Resurrection Sunday, we're, we're entering a season where it is something we take particular note of. Because loved ones, apart from Christ, there is no entering into the rest of God. Apart from Christ, we, we cannot be freed from the slavery of sin and death. Apart from Christ, we are still in bondage in Egypt. Paul says for that generation that Christ was the rock that nourished them with water in the desert, but they rejected him. Instead, they hardened their hearts. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. Behold, the new beginning has come and the old is going. But even in our seasons of walking with the Lord, we, we have times of renewal. We have times of, of new beginnings, seasons of new beginnings, times that, that, that press us in closer to the Lord, times that remind us that we cannot do this on our own, times that show us where we have set up idols that have replaced God in our hearts, times when the Spirit calls us to be near as we more and more trust in the Lord and his purposes and we live for him and we long for his return. We're entering into a, a new season where things are springing to life. We're, we're leaving that cold, drab winter behind us, praise the Lord. And visually, that entering into spring, is, it's beautiful. Today, will you allow your heart to match what's taking place outside in nature? Today, will you allow the Holy Spirit who, who has been seeking you, who has been trying to get to your attention, who's been trying to speak to you? Will you allow him to do a work in your life? Will you open your eyes to what potentially your new beginning could be? Israel did not listen. And they did not enter the rest. They did not, that generation did not enter the promised land. Today he's inviting you into a new beginning. And it comes by way of Christ and his gospel, the better Moses, the rock who nourished the Israelites in the desert, 
The, the one who is foreshadowed in the, the raising up of the serpent on the cross, bringing healing to all who would look upon it. For no one enters the rest of God apart from Christ. As we will look at next week, he fulfills where Israel failed as God's chosen. John Bunyan, of course, famous for his novel, Pilgrim's Progress, wrote uh, another book. It was his autobiography entitled, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, where he's very honest about his coming to faith and, and all the fears and the doubts that, that crept in on him. It, he kept returning to his old ways and his old patterns and lifestyles in his life, and he went through a particularly dark point when he heard the words, sell and part with this most blessed Christ. Let him go, if you will. And he tells us that I felt my heart freely consent thereto. Oh, the diligence of Satan. Oh, the desperateness of man's heart. For two years, he says, he was in the doom of damnation. I feared that this wicked sin of mine might be that sin unpardonable. Oh, no one knows the terrors of those days but myself. I found it a hard work now to pray to God because despair was swallowing me up. Then comes what seemed to be the decisive moment. One day as I was passing into the field, this sentence fell upon my soul. My righteousness is in heaven. And I saw with the eyes of my soul Jesus Christ at God's right hand. There, I say, was my righteousness so that wherever I was or whatever I was doing, God could not say of me, he lacks my righteousness for that was just before him. I also saw, moreover, that it was not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness was Jesus Christ himself, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now did my chains fall off my legs indeed. I was loosed from my afflictions and irons. My temptations also fled away so that from that time those dreadful scriptures of God about the unforgivable sin left off to trouble me no more. Now went I also home rejoicing for the grace and love of God. If you are in Christ, you have been saved. But Scripture still warns us to be diligent in working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Beloved, it is because our salvation is secure that we are able to ask questions of ourselves, seeking to make sure that what we are, that, 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 that evidence is being made in, in bearing fruit to others. He's calling us to newness every day by the renewing of your mind that we would present our bodies as a sacrifice. And so my question to you again, the number 40 is irrelevant here. It doesn't matter. That's legalism if, you, if you're trying to not eat chocolate for 40 days and then feel shame and guilt if you did. No, what is relevant here is what is your response? Is the Holy Spirit driving you into deeper relationship with the Lord God? Is your confidence, is your, is your hope in other things? Have you set up idols in, in, in which... They're pulling your heart away from, from your soul north star, the Lord Jesus Christ. All this week, I've, I've felt that pain in my own heart as I've had to wrestle with this myself. Well, what are the things that are 
detracting me? Where is the fruit of the Spirit not evident in my life? And are those things of any real value? Can I destroy those idols and put Christ at the center because he has saved me, he has rescued me, and now I can live with joy in what he has given me? What will your response be? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion and encourage one another in reminding one another of these good things. For our hope is in Christ, but he's calling us to newness of life, body. Let us pray. Father, sometimes our hearts desire the things like the season of Lent so that we can tick a box and feel accomplished. When the real difficulty is in the soul-searching work, in the asking ourselves of questions of, of am, I, am I trusting in the Lord? Not that that brings me salvation because the salvation has been given to me as a gift. But now that I stand upon that knowledge and that assurance of salvation, what will my response be? Will I continue to live for self? Will I continue to be tossed about? Or will I consider the audience of one? Will I consider what my Savior did for me and with a repentant heart ask forgiveness and ask that he would turn me around and send me back to himself? Oh, Father, that your spirit would be stirring in this place this morning, that you would be drawing us to yourself. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.